going to read the gospel tonight, and uh, I, I picked the chapter after the passing away of Sri Ramakrishna, which was interesting to me at first as to why to do that, but mostly because uh, that's really the condition we find ourselves in, right? I mean, we're, we exist after the Master's passing away, and we're carrying on with our spiritual lives, and uh, there's just a beautiful bit of occurrences here that are enriching and, and quite lovely and actually speak very personally to us about how to carry on and how to um, manifest the spirit and, and life of, of a being that we haven't actually met in the flesh as such or didn't know in the same way that the disciples did. And yet we have been heirs to his truths and his teachings. I often think that how lucky it would be to be in that place and time, you know, to <laughs> be able to see the master dance in ecstasy or just stand up and, you know, become a child and, uh, and watch, you know, just all the things that, that we read about. I mean, some of my favorite things are rather unorthodox, but, you know, when he did his Hanuman period where he worshiped Rama as a monkey and he lived in a tree out in the garden, I think that would be cool to see. <laughs> I think that would be fun to spend some time with him, you know, to see how he managed to do that. Or when he dressed up as a as a gopi for six months, you know, and was was so convincing as a woman that you know nobody could tell, nobody knew who he was or would recognize him. And uh, and just to see him in that sweetness of being the handmaiden to God, I think would have would have taught us taught me so much about how to be in a body, you know, how to be what you are and how to relate to the divine. But when I think about that also, I think it, it really can't be that way, because I mean, that would be very unjust if, if it was all of the advantage in the world to be with Thakur, and that here we are with no advantage. And uh, in thinking about that, I kind of realized that, you know, at the time that they were with Ramakrishna, he had no name or fame at all. Uh, and uh, was just a small, uh, very odd uh, character, you know, a, a, a worshiper at the temple there. And uh, they only got to hear what they happened to be in the room for. They only got to learn what he happened to teach them in that hour of the week that they went to visit him or went to see him. They had nothing really to go on to know who he was or what he was. Uh, there were there was there were no centers around that they could go to. There was you know very few devotees around at that time that they could really share with, and so that really lines up a lot of advantages that we have. You know we've got the complete works of Swamiji that we can sit down and browse through any time we want to. We've got you know several lives of the Master that we can meditate on and read. Uh, we don't just have the clips of the few moments that we got to spend with him, you know, during the week. And we know that his name has gone around the world, and we've seen that he's affecting people of different nationalities, different uh, ethnicities, uh, different dispositions, different religions, uh, and that he is harmonizing uh, in a beautiful way the teachings of these world religions. So we have quite an advantage to these young men in some ways. We've got a lot of tools available to us to take our spiritual life much deeper. And we can see his overall teaching. We can understand his big picture, or at least make an attempt at it, and, uh, and be affected in that way. So this evening, we're going to read about uh, them doing the worship of Shiva in the temple compound. So it's outside of the temple, which I like says, the worship of Shiva was to take place under the bell tree in the monastery compound. The deity was to be worshipped four times during the four watches of the night. The brothers assembled under the bell tree. Bhupati and M were also present. One of the young members of the Mat was in charge of the worship. Kali was reading from the Gita. Now and then he argued with Narendra. <laughs> Kali. I alone am everything. I create, I preserve, and destroy. Narendra, how is it possible for me to create? Another power creates through me. 
Our various actions, even our thoughts, are caused by that power. So this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, perspective here, because it's one that we're all going to grow into, this notion that we're not the doer, that, that this world is going on. As I understand it at this point in my life, that you know our mind is the container, the purse for our karma. And the body is, is kind of a step down from the mind, created by the mind, a, different, a lower vibration, as it were. And that the body-mind is basically what we, the spirit, are mixed up with in thinking that they identify us somehow, watch their actions. And it's, but really, the body carries on as the mind carries it on. The body tells the mind, I'm hungry. The mind goes about planning and getting it some food. You know, the body says, I'm tired. The, the mind knows where it lives and sends the body there to get some sleep that night. And on and on like that, that the body and the mind, the body and mind carry on. Uh, that's the, the wheel of samsara rolling down the hill. And it's really our attachment to it that makes us think that we are a part of that or that we're responsible for it. I know I've told this story before, but it, it really helps paint that picture for me to understand how it's possible to think so clearly that we're the doer when, in fact, we're not. It was in the Phoenix airport. Do you remember that story that I tell about this little boy? He was probably no more than four or five years old. And he was at the gate, and there was this uh, car racing video game that was there. And it had one of those, you know, pre-drawn tracks. This was in the 90s or... Yeah, 90, either the 90s or maybe the early 2000s. So it wasn't, it wasn't a fancy game, but it was just one of those tracks and you had to race the car around it and keep it on the track and the, and the game had a steering wheel on it. And there was this young boy, like I said, a toddler. His name was, uh, I think his name was Joey. And he was sitting there and, and reaching up to the steering wheel was very carefully, you know, keeping that car on the track all the way, all the time. And his father came over and tapped him on the head and said, hey, Joey, they just called our plane. We get to go on the airplane now. And Joey's like, I can't. If I, like, if I I'll wreck the car. Let me finish. Let me finish. His dad says, Joey, they're, they're, they're calling our name. We have to go. So he takes Joey's hand and pulls him away, and Joey gets pulled off the steering wheel. And miraculously, the car stays on the track because it turns out that Joey had not put a quarter into the machine <laughs> and that the machine was just running on demo mode. But because Joey's, Joey's idea was to keep the car on the track in the same way that the game's programming was to keep the car on the track, because it seemed to respond to Joey's turns because he was following the curve of the track as the car was going, there was enough of that indication that most of the time things were going his direction. He could tell when the car was following it or not. So he assumed his responsibility for the movement of the car and wanted to adjust his behavior for that reason. And so it's kind of like that. Well, so it, it gave that he was in charge. The track, and so it is in our lives. This absurdity of him being the doer. And the master used the master used to say, as long as a man feels that it is he who meditates, he is under the jurisdiction of Adya Shakti. Shakti must be acknowledged. Kali reflected in silence for a few moments and then said, "The actions you are talking about are illusory. There is not even any such thing as thought." The very idea of these things makes me laugh, <coughs> which is it perfectly points out the difficulty of having a conversation with a Vedantist, because <laughs> they can keep abstracting <laughs> that sense of I one layer out, you know, all the way to the end. So here he's going to agree, okay, well you're not the doer, and then he's going to say, well that doesn't matter because nothing's actually being done. You know, and that's an experience that we can have now. It's like, again, I always go to the dream world for these ideas. Because last night in your dream, you, know, you might have built a tower, you know, and you might have sweat doing it. You were hungry doing it. You were thought you were accomplishing a great thing doing it. And you picked up the bricks. You felt them. They were heavy. You moved them. They stayed where you put them. And the thing was built. But when you wake up in the morning, where, where's the tower? What was done? 
And so you see, we're, we're, we can understand both of these things. One, you as the dream body are not the doer, right? Because the person who's actually dreaming is the one who's doing everything. But he's not just doing what you as the dream person, the, the dream identity is doing. The dreamer is actually building the whole world, actually sustaining the entire story of the dream, taking it all and, and creating it all in real time. That's you. Can you do that now? Can you close your eyes and create that dream world to that level of, of, of uh, detail? Are you able to do that? How, how is it that you're able to do it when you sleep, when, you, <laughs> when you're resting and you can't even begin to do it now? And you see these, the, the way that our mind is compartmentalized, you know? And it makes it easier to understand that really maybe there is a universal mind and maybe it is quite obvious, but we're so easily able to boundary our minds and only use a portion of them so that when we fall asleep at night, we completely forget about our 57 years of experience in this waking world. And we take on a brand new body in the dream, who knows what it is, or even if it's a full body, we don't even question it. We just take on that new identity so easily and we set about our tasks, fully believing that this is where we are and this is what we're doing. We have completely and utterly forgotten, not just our past births, which is one we always like to talk about, but even our current birth. <laughs> we, forgot, we forgot what the guy that's, or the woman sleeping in the bed is all about. 100% we've left that aside. You know, and of course now I have to tell my Aura patient on the story too. He was in Taruco and I had told him about this lucid dream that I had once. And so he called me up and he said, I had to share this dream with you. He said, it was, it was, it was amazing. He said, I was in my dream and I was weeding the garden and one of the gardeners told me a joke and I didn't get it in the dream. I didn't understand the joke. And he said, so the next morning I was outside and I was sort of in the same part of the garden. And so I remembered the dream and I remembered the joke that was told to me in the dream. And I still didn't get it. He says, but then I was going on about my chores later in the afternoon and I got the joke and I busted out laughing out loud. <laughs> now he said, go figure what just happened to me. He said, my own mind tells me, the owner of my mind, a joke that I, having the mind, can't figure out. Not because it's not a great joke, because it takes me two hours to understand the joke that I told myself in my own dream last night. Ten hours, Ten hours whatever it was. Now this, this is what we're working with. This is this mind that we carry around in our head that has us, that, that can change so completely and we just go right along with it at any moment without any thought at all about it. Oh, well, of course, I'm a bird. Yes, yes, I can fly naturally. Of course, that's perfectly observable. And look, I'm doing it. See how easily it's done. And I've been flying forever. I think I'll stop and eat something, you know. There's an absurdity to this and we shouldn't forget it. There's a great, delicious absurdity in the midst of our idea of who and what we are. And we think that this world is real because we've, even giving those stories and that subset, it's so clear that this world could be anything, you know? We have no idea whatsoever, and yet we find a security in it, you know? The reality is we're in a very small box, has four sides, and we can reach out and touch those four sides, and we think we're safe. But the fact is there's no top and no bottom, so you're in free fall. Ah, but I know. I know, I'm a, I'm a man, and I live here in this city, and I'm working, and I'm doing this. I can reach out and touch those sides. I'm very secure, but you're free-falling. And you should always remember that when you approach these truths and you approach the divine, even in your meditation. Really give up that sense of knowing, that sense of having any idea of the how of what needs to be accomplished. Really inform your surrender with this information, with this knowledge, that God could have you flapping your wings and flying from flower to flower at this very moment as easily as he has you sitting in a, a church pew in Los Angeles, Hollywood of all places. 
talking about spiritual life. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> so Kali reflected in silence for a few moments and said, the actions you're talking about are illusory. There's not even any such thing as thought. The very idea of these things makes me laugh, which is a wonderful reaction to it all and one that I heavily encourage. Your spiritual life should always make you laugh. Not always, but quite frequently. If your spiritual life isn't a source of laughter for you, try something different. <laughs> Don't be quite so serious about it. You know, you read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna as we are, and you'll find it's hard to go a page or two without him saying everybody laughed or everybody was laughing in the room that the absurdity of our situation is only laughable. The, 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 the depth of our delusion is only laughable. You know? That we shouldn't be, remain caught in this story, we shouldn't remain caught in this illusion to feel a sense of panic. Oh my God, I have to fix something, I have to do something. No, understand that you are in the arms of the Beloved Mother always. In all of these conditions, as random as they may or may not be, all of them are temporary. All of them are going to go away. And she says to you that that's a comfort. Don't hold on to these things. Let them come, laugh at them, enjoy them, giggle about them, understand the absurdity of all of it, and let them go away. You will always remain. You know. <clears throat> Narendra, the I that is implied in I am he is not this ego. It is that which remains after one eliminates mind, body, and so on. This is a very important thing, you know, because uh, Advaita Vedanta, you know, says that thou art that. And uh, unfortunately, when somebody says thou art that, the only thou that we know of is this ego self, you know, this body-mind thing. Because we really don't hold on to, to the obvious tightly enough, <laughs> you know, that if we're going to say this body is mine, which body is, is you, you know? Is, is, it the, is it that one that was, you know, 18 inches tall and six and a half pounds? You know, is, is that the you you're talking about? Or was it the eight-year-old, you know? smooth-bodied, you know, happy child? Or, you know, is it the sagging, melting, 57-year-old Swami at the front of the room? Which one are you if you are the body? Three radically different manifestations, all of them radically different, none of them fit in the other. And yet we have this belief, this is me, this is the I. So it's not the I. This I is what remains after the body, mind, uh, and everything else is gone. Now, what kind of I is that? It's the I that can be anything in a dream. It's the I that can be every one of us simultaneously and still be one without a second. It's the I that can imagine itself separate from everything in the world and yet at the same time be one with everything in the world. It's an I that can tell itself a joke and not understand it until it lets itself some time later. So we really are at the mercy of something extraordinary. After completing the recital of the Gita, Kali chanted, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Narendra and the other devotees stood up and circled round and round the tree, singing and dancing. Now and then they chanted in chorus, Shiva Guru, Shiva Guru. <laughs> What an unusual <laughs> image going on here. And they're dancing around a tree. Okay, when was the last time we danced around a tree <laughs> in here? Shouting anything. <laughs> you know? And dancing. What a joy. What a joy this is, you know? It's a great suggestion for your practice. You know, instead of having always such a solemn shrine room of s such quiet, well-behaved, you know, meditators, Kick it up sometime. <laughs> Get in there, put on some nice dance music, and you and Takor sing the name of God and just dance your heart out. I mean, literally, kick it up with some great joy. It's it is important. You know, I say these things in a fun way because I enjoy them, for one. 
but also because this is the nature of spiritual life for those practitioners who have seen and have touched something. You know, for those of us that are just seemingly desperately trying to accomplish something, we get so serious, we get so bogged down in what we assume our condition to be. This separation from God, which is totally false and not real, becomes so real to us that it makes us hungry and we, we start approaching God like we approach a sandwich, you know? <laughs> that we have to go through it, we have to make this, we have to earn it, we have to eat it, we have to digest it, when all of that's just not so. God is your very own. And what does that mean? That means he's closer than your mother, closer than your best friend. If you treated your best friend like you treat God, how close of a friend would they be? Ask yourself. If you spoke to your best friend only in the way that you speak to God, how, how close of a friend would they be? So always remember that the beloved is your very own. And it's a wonderful thing to enjoy that. Take a chance on it, you know, try a joke that you might be worried about offending Takor with. Uh. You know, he was a very colorful and beautiful person and the limits of his love were never reached. So enjoy yourself. You might, you might make something, you might do something wrong. He, he'll chuckle. He'll slap you. Oh, he'll slap you maybe. <laughs> well, <laughs> is that on record? Has he slapped anybody? Yeah, Who did twice. he slay? Who? The guy on the Ganga, he was chanting the name of God. He was absent-minded. Oh. I go and slap him with both Oh, things. and then the Rani woman, Rani Rasmani. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> See, there's another advantage to being here 200 years later. <laughs> You're not going to get slapped in the temple. All right. <laughs> It was midnight. Oh, okay, there's another thing. It's midnight, and they're out there dancing around trees and singing the name of God. It was midnight, the 14th day of the dark fortnight of the moon. Pitch darkness filled all the quarters. Men, birds, and animals were all hushed into silence. The young sannyasis were clad in Garoa robes. The words Shiva Guru, chanted in their full-throated voices, rose into the infinite sky like the rumblings of rain clouds and disappeared in the indivisible Satchit Ananda. There's a beautiful thing to read for meditation right there. It reminds me, I, the, when I t took my sannyas in 2012, uh, we all went to Jairambati, mother's hometown, uh, for a day. And we went walking out into the rice paddies, and there was this giant kind of umbrella tree that was out there that we were walking toward in order to go and chant the new mantras, the sannyas mantras that all of us had learned. So we were on our way out there, and when you walk through a rice paddy, everybody has to walk on the berms, right? Because otherwise it's all muddy and you get all wet. So there was 50 of us that had taken sannyas, and I'm toward the end of the line, and we're walking out there and the wind is blowing and the sky is that kind of dark post-monsoon sort of purple, you know, where it looks stormy but probably isn't going to be. The sun's coming in at a pretty sharp angle so things have kind of a brightness to them. And I remember how, how unreal the lime green hue of that rice, the rice paddies were. And then looking along in front of me and seeing 50 young men dressed in Garoa with their robes blowing to the side in the wind. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at myself and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm walking through a rice paddy in Chirampati, India, in orange robes, following a band of 50 men who have just renounced the world singing going off to a tree to, to chant Sanskrit verses <laughs> about renunciation. And I'm just sitting there trying to put that into my world somehow, trying to figure out how, how, how did this happen? How, how do you get here? <laughs> you know, it's like there, nothing explains anything. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, Im it's impossible that it's happening. And yet there it is being carried out right there in front of me. And it's moments like that, you know, where, where you, you, you laugh, you chuckle, you realize this can't be happening. There is no explanation for this. 
I never did anything for this to happen. I just one foot in front of another and crazy things happen. This is the nature of the divine. And this is staying awake at that level, always somewhere inside so that you don't think that your life is mundane. Because if you're paying attention, your life is miraculous. You don't even understand the nature of breathing in at this moment. You don't understand how your finger is moving. You know, you, you're not understanding, you, you can't define a thought. You can't tell me what a thought is. Where does it come from and where does it go? And how is it that a thought can actually manifest something in the world? And why is it that only some thoughts do and other ones don't? Why are you what you are? Why have you selected the random thoughts that you have to call yours, to identify you as? Because certainly even if right now for the next 30 seconds you watch your thoughts, you'll think and see a lot of things that you don't consider to be you. And yet you'll see other thoughts that do describe you and that are closer to your thoughts. How does that happen? What does it mean? What does it teach us about ourselves? So here we see life is this way. It was morning and the devotees went to the shrine room, prostrated themselves before the deity and gradually assembled in the big hall. Narendra was clad in a new ochre cloth. The bright orange color of his apparel blended with the celestial luster of his face and body, every pore of which radiated a divine light. His countenance was filled with fiery brilliance and yet touched with the tenderness of love. You know, this radiated with a divine light. It's no mistake that the very next sentence says that it's touched with the tenderness of love because the light that he's radiating is that pure Satchit Ananda love, the Ananda, you know, that bliss, that, that love that comes out and, and goes freely to anybody within its purveyance, within its reach. That light and love are the same thing we've come to learn. And to remember that will certainly change the quality of your day. When you're outside, you don't just feel the heat of the sun and think, oh God, it's 90 degrees out here again. But you think of this as love. Light and love are the same. That's the realization. And then to know and believe the love of God becomes quite a bit simpler. And then to know the equanimity of the love of God becomes even easier to see as you look around and see everybody in the 90 degree love of God running around the streets wearing less and less to get more and more of it. Touched with the tenderness of a love, he appeared to all as a bubble that had risen up out of the ocean of the absolute existence and bliss and assumed a human body to help in the propagation of his master's message. All eyes were fixed on him. Narendra was then just 24 years old, the very age at which the great Chaitanya had renounced the world. Balaram had sent fruit and sweets to the monastery for the devotees' breakfast. Rakal, Narendra, and another few partook of the refreshments. After eating one or two morsels, some of them cried out, Blessed indeed is Balaram, and everyone laughed. <laughs> so again, here you have it all going on. You see how, the beautiful, how beautiful M's mind was. You know, how he can, he can paint these pictures and draw, in, draw into, like, he's, he's 24 years old. He doesn't just say he's 24 years old. He's at the same age that Chaitanya was when he renounced the world. That's a mature spiritual mind, you know, so that when you look at something, spiritual implications are drawn in at the same time. That's what we're trying to do when they say purify your mind. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to set up these associations of mind to always be going toward the beloved, always going, being, going toward uh, that joy, that contentment, that fulfillment, the constant reminder that this moment is perfect as it is and doesn't need to be changed. Always holding on to that idea and feeding it so that everything reminds you of God during the day. So these little things that we talk about, light is love, that's a very important one. It's everywhere all around you. 
uh, to try and, and uh, to see God in everything around you, every person, to understand that every action is a prayer, that, that when, when the New Testament says pray without ceasing, it's not something that you have to do. That's something that you have to realize you're doing, right? That everything you do in the day is a prayer to God, to the beloved, for something. And our requirement is to become aware of that prayer so that we can focus that prayer and so that we can approach the divine and leave behind ignorance faster, more effectively, just by being aware of the prayer that we're praying at every moment to make sure that it's going to give us what we really want to get. You know, I always use that example. It's like, uh, I always wanted to be famous growing up in eighth grade. I, I made the mistake of doing one school play where I played a caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I knew immediately I was gonna be rich and famous someday <laughs> from because I was a great caterpillar that I put my winter jacket on backwards so that I would have all this little, anyway, <laughs> on with these things. And yet when I scheduled an audition for the next play, it was on Saturday morning at 8.15 was my audition. Teenagers don't get out of bed to go to an audition at 8.15 in the morning on a Saturday, right? And so my prayer for, for fame kind of got mixed with my prayer for sleep, kind of got mixed with my prayer for a late breakfast, and somehow and, you know, by the time I was in ninth grade, I still wasn't famous and was wondering why. <laughs> why am I not famous yet? And so this is why it's important for you to be focused in what you pray for, to understand that it's not just the things you're saying to God that you want or that you need or that you hope, but it's the way that you're living that's praying the real prayer. You know, the things that you're doing and the things that you're saying and the way that you're treating others and whatnot. And so to, to constantly try and put things into your mind and into your life that point you in the right direction, whether it's a little tag on, on your door on the way out, remember everybody's God, <laughs> you know, or uh, always keep like a, a dollar bill by the door to give away to somebody, you know, during the day. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. It's one of the things that really helped me when I first got to LA because I, I thought everybody was so cold, and so distant here. <laughs> so I one started practicing trying to see see God in people's eyes and like the cashier down here, the poor cashier down here at the Yucca Market, you know, the first few times that I was a little weird because I was looking a little too intensely at her eyes <laughs> and saying stuff a little bit too friendly because I was trying to talk to Takor instead of her, you know, <laughs> and see her there. But you know, you practice those things and they they become weird sometimes <laughs> when, when you, but this is what this is what makes life worth living this is what makes it beautiful when you start manifesting what you know to be true about yourself but you haven't quite seen yet that you are a light and that you are a source of love to every stranger on the street out there and that you can give as much as you want you're never going to run out because it's your infinite nature of love and joy and knowledge that you're walking around with. And it's up to you to share that, to not be embarrassed because you smiled first or maybe a little bit too long or maybe they might get the wrong idea. That doesn't matter. Love, be a fool in a beautiful way for the divine. So everybody praising Balaram for bringing all the food for breakfast. Narendra now began to joke like a child. Okay, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's interesting. Because how did he just describe Narendra, you know, as if he was this, this radiating saint of, you know, solitude and renunciation like Chaitanya's, you know, whose face glowed with a majestic, you know, holy light. And now he's joking in the same, in the same paragraph, he's joking like a child. So this is very close to what real holiness is. This is what knowing God is, you know? It's, it's this, that kind of light that you can be that stoic and that beautiful and yet so utterly approachable and so utterly comfortable with everyone 
all the time because there's no ego guarding. There's no ego calculating. How am I coming across? What are people thinking of me? Is that pimple gone off my cheek yet? You know, <laughs> what are all these things? Because that's, that's, what, that's what breaks us down. That's what makes us small. The ego keeps you boundaried, keeps reminding you of what you can't do, keeps reminding you of why you're not good enough, or it keeps you, keeps you reminded of how great you are, <laughs> whatever your trouble is. You know, the ego is there all the time. It's up to you to live beyond it, to see it is not real, that it's not you, and you don't have to be defined by it, by remembering that it's a story. Your life is a story, and it can change on a dime. This moment, there's no reason that yesterday has to determine what your choices are today. Get up and be completely crazy if you want to. Get up and be a completely different person if you want to. There's no reason to be limited by your history. There's no reason for you to fence in and be anxious because of your future. You've got a moment here where you're at the top of the hill. You can go any direction you want out of this temple. You can go anywhere you want. You don't have to go home. You never have to go home again. You can get out and walk as far that direction as you want and just keep going till the money runs out. And then maybe a job will come along, and suddenly you're living a life you never thought you had possible. This is up to you, always. Only to the degree that you believe in ego, to that degree are you limited in what you choose to do. So be free and joke like a child. He was imitating Sri Ramakrishna. Mm -hmm. He put a sweet into his mouth and stood still as if he was in samadhi. <laughs> His eyes remained unwinking. A devotee stepped forward and pretended to hold him up by the hand lest he should drop to the ground. Narendra closed his eyes, you know, tilts his head back. A few minutes later, with the sweetmeat still in his mouth, he opens his eyes and drawled out, I'm all right. <laughs> and everyone laughs loudly. Of course they would. <laughs> Refreshments were now given to everyone. M looked on that on this with wonderful as a wonderful mart of happiness. The devotees shouted joyfully, Jai Guru Maharaj, Jai Guru Maharaj. So you see this intimacy that they felt, making fun of the master, you know, he was one of them. We've we've of course have put this boring old man way up over there, out of the way, you know, just sit there silently looking out over us, waiting for us to realize something. <laughs> but he's not. He's sitting with you. He's in your mind. He's the source of your thoughts. He is more familiar with you than you are at this moment. And his chuckling is loud and enormous and frequent. You know, this life is his play and his creation, and he dances mercilessly through it. And you're that companion. There's a beautiful Hafiz poem where he's saying, if you had just twirled one more time on your rooftop last night, the beloved and I had run to get our dancing clothes on, but when we came back, you had already stopped. If you had twirled just one more time, you know, and always have that idea of the beloved being there in your meditation. You know, just don't give up too early. Sit there and enjoy that meditation. Enjoy being in the presence of God. And if you can't enjoy being in the presence of God, try something different. <laughs> because there's no other way to be in the presence of the beloved. This divine relationship, you may only remember this small moment of it in this life, but you've been in this relationship with the beloved for eons, for thousands of years. He has watched your thoughts through, through your body as a rock, <laughs> maybe, through your body as a tree, through a fish, through a turtle, all these wonderful little games that you've been playing in this world as you've gone through the millennium to end up as this, whatever this is, wherever you think you might be, doing whatever you imagine is happening. And the beloved has been there yelling joyfully the whole time, Jai Guru Maharaj. M arrived at the Baranagor Mat to visit his brother disciples. This is Monday, March 25th, 1887. Devendra accompanied him. 
M had been coming to the monastery very frequently and now and then had spent a day or two. The previous week he had spent three days at the Mott. He was very eager to observe the spirit of intense renunciation of these young men. It was evening. M intended to spend the night in the monastery. Sashi lighted the lamp in the worship room and chanted the name of God. Next, he burnt incense before all the pictures of gods and goddesses in the various rooms. The evening service began, and Sashi conducted the worship. The members of the Mat, with M and Devendra, stood with folded hands and sang the hymns of Arati. Huh. There it is. See, we're still doing this together. When the worship was over, Narendra and M became engaged in the conversation. Narendra was recalling his various meetings with Sri Ramakrishna. Narendra, one day, during one of my early visits, the master in an ecstatic mood said to me, you've come, how amazing. <laughs> I said to myself, it's as if he's known me for a long time. And then he said to me, do you ever see light? I replied, yes, sir. Before I fall asleep, I feel something like a light revolving near my forehead. M, do you see it even now? Narendra, well, I used to see it frequently. In Jadu Malik's garden house, the master one day touched me and muttered something to himself. I became unconscious. The effect of the touch lingered with me for a month, like an intoxication. When he heard that a proposal had been made about my marriage, he wept, holding the feet of the image of Kali. With tears in his eyes, he prayed to the Divine Mother, O oh, Mother, please upset this whole thing. Don't let Narendra be drowned. <laughs> right. I would like to read that as if that's normal. <laughs> I, would, I really want that to be normal. But picture this. Are you picturing what's going on here? Narendra is standing there. He barely knows the master, doesn't know anything about him. And the master is in the temple, you know, the Kali temple. I mean, it's a formal temple. They're clutching the feet of Kali, hugging the feet of Kali, <laughs> saying about Narendra's marriage, oh, mess this up somehow, Lord. <laughs> don't, don't let this guy be drowned. What does that make you think? What would, what would Narendra be thinking, you know, at that moment? It's like, oh my gosh, you know, or just to be touched like that, just to touch. And for a month, for a month, you're intoxicated. For a month. I don't know. You see, there were some advantages to being there. All right. After my father's death, my mother and my brothers were starving. Okay. When the master met Anada Guha one day, he said to him, Narendra's father has died. His family is in a state of great privation. It would be good if his friends helped him now with money. After Anada had left, I scolded him. I said, why did you say all those things to him? Thus rebuked, he wept and said, alas, for your sake, I could beg from door to door. He tamed us by his love. Don't you think so? Think about that. The master weeping because of, of his desire to help you, running out and begging people to give money to alleviate your problems. And you ask him, to, you scold him, stop it, you're embarrassing me. And he begins weeping for you, wishing that he could do something to help you. These are, these are hints to the love that God has for us that, that are so easy to read over, <laughs> you know, so, over, so easy to let these words just kind of slide through the mind. But what great effect they have if we stop and we hold them for a moment, hold them close and listen to them. He tamed us by his love, don't you think so? You see, that's how God's going to tame you. <laughs> By love, not because he's going to yell at you hard enough or hit you hard enough or even slap you in the temple. <laughs> Actually, I don't think he really did that. He prayed to the Divine Mother that he wouldn't do it anymore. Oh, that's right. Apparently it stopped. Okay, so you're free. Yeah, it won't happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> so he tamed us by his love, don't you think so? 
So these are the things when we sit in, in meditation, we're sitting in the presence of that love. You know, we're sitting, we're getting a, a love tan, as it were, just sitting in the presence of God. And that's all you have to do is just constantly remember that you're in the presence of God so that the, that, that what is obvious can become apparent. You know, it's trying to know that you're in the dream while you're still dreaming. That's what we're trying to do. And so we sit there aware that God's love is infinite, everywhere present, that there's nowhere away from that love, that it's unconditioned, has no reason to it. It doesn't come from a place of need or a place of want. It's the isness. It's the moment. It is, it is this moment. This moment is love is wisdom, is presence. The fact that we experience it is because God has loaned us that presence, that existence. The inspiration you feel when the heart actually catches some of that love is because the mother has loaned you the ability to feel that and to express that. And that what you learn in the moment when you get an aha, or you, you think of something beautiful, you're faced with something beautiful, it's because the mother has loaned you her intelligence so that you could learn from this random whatnot of whatever it might be. <laughs> um, there is not the slightest doubt about it. His love was utterly unselfish. Narendra. One day when I was alone with him, he said something to me. Nobody else was present. Please don't repeat it to anyone here. <laughs> All right, don't tell Emma a secret. <laughs> that's, that's what we're learning here. No, I shall not. What did he say? <laughs> he said, it is not possible for me to exercise occult powers, but I shall do so through you. What do you say? No, I replied, you aren't going to do that. <laughs> I used to laugh at his words. You must have heard all these things from him. I told him that his visions of God were all hallucinations of his mind. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, so there's quite a few delicious little things going on here. One, it's the irony of it is beautiful that he's telling him a secret and says, don't tell anybody here. And here it's written in a book, published, you know for all of us to sit and giggle at as they talk about it. And the master saying, I'm going to exercise occult powers through you. And he says, no, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> and then to say, I used to laugh at his words. You know, Takor's words, I mean, Narendra laughing at his words and telling him he's hallucinating that all of his experiences are <laughs> here. This is Narendra, this is Swami Vivekananda laughing at the master's words, not taking them seriously, telling him he's hallucinating at all these things that he's seeing. You know what's incredible about that? This was his best student. So it's not just agreement that makes you a great student. It's not just sitting there and studiously doing what you're told that makes you a good student. It's being alive and authentic and real in your relationship with the beloved that makes you a good student. If you don't believe it, know that you don't believe it. If you can't digest it, know that you can't digest it. Give yourself space and time. Laugh at the teaching if you can't, if you can't see it as true. You know, the master stuck with Rob, with Vivekananda and look look at what look what he created in Vivekananda look look where he took that man you know from from laughing and and not understanding to living and seeing to where where he could just sit down and write nine volumes of information of insight of wisdom of some of the most inspiring words you can put on paper and still have that only be a fraction of what he was still at the end of his life saying, no, I won't write a life of Ramakrishna. I couldn't even begin to know what to write for that. Yeah. 
So it's just wonderful. I used to laugh at his words. You must have heard all these things from him. I told him that his visions of God were all hallucinations of his mind. He said to me, I used to climb to the roof of the Kuti and cry, O oh, devotees, where are you all? Come to me. O oh, devotees, I am about to die. I shall certainly die if I do not see you. And the Divine Mother told me, the devotees will come. You see, everything is turning out to be true. What else could I say? I kept quiet. One day he closed the door of his room and said to Devendra Babu and Girish Babu, referring to me, he will not keep his body if he is told who he is. M. Yes, we've heard that. Many a time he repeated that same thing to us too. Once you came to know about your true self in Nirvikalpa Samadhi at the Kasipur Garden House, isn't that true? Narendra, yes. In that experience, I, f I felt like I had no body. I could see only my face. The master was in the upstairs room. I had that experience downstairs. I was weeping. I said, what has happened to me? The elder Gopal went to the master's room and said, Narendra is crying. When I saw the master, he said to me, now you have known, but I'm going to keep the key with me. I said to him, what is it that happened to me? Turning to the devotees, he said, he will not keep his body if he knows who he is, but I have put the key, I have put a veil over his eyes. <laughs> now, now, this is sort of like that joke that our patient underheard in his own dream, because here Narendra is in the same room and the master is saying, I've put a veil over his eyes so that he won't know who he is, because if he knows who he is, he won't stick around. So you can see how the tricks of the Lord, how, how <laughs> you know, that he can, he can say the secret right in front of you and you won't hear it. You won't, you won't understand it. If he's got a veil in front of you, he doesn't even ask you to leave the room. <laughs> I have noticed a peculiar thing. Some men, objects, or places make me feel as if I had seen them before in a previous birth. They appear familiar to me. One day I went to Sharat's house in Calcutta on Amherst Street. Immediately I said to Sharat, this house seems familiar to me. It seems to me that I have known the rooms, the passages, and the rest of the house for many, many days. I used to follow my own whims in everything that I did. The master never interfered. You know that I became a member of the Sadharan Brahmo Samaj. M. Yes, I know that. Narendra. The master knew that women attended the meetings of the Brahmo Samaj. A man cannot meditate when women are sitting in front of him. Therefore, he criticized the meditation of the Brahmo Samaj. But he didn't object to my going there. But one day he did say to me, don't tell Rakal about your being a member of the Brahmo Samaj or he too will feel like becoming one. M, you have greater strength of mind. That is why the master didn't prevent your going to the Samaj. Narendra, excuse me. I have attained my present state of mind as a result of much suffering and pain. You have not passed through any such suffering. I now realize that without trials and tribulations, one cannot resign oneself to God and depend on him absolutely. Well, there's a, there's a difficult teaching there. I have attained my present state of mind as a result of much suffering and pain. He said, he was quoted last night, we're reading this by Nikhilananda, the life of Vivekananda. And in there, Vivekananda said, I'll tell you one truth. The higher your ideal, the more you will suffer. You know? And so you see this in him the suffering that he went through, but there's a beautiful lesson behind it, and it's a promise that all of us have. I, as a Christian growing up, I remember reading, I think it's Romans 8, 28, you don't have to check it, but <laughs> where it says, all things work together for good to those that love God, you know? And, and when, when Vivekananda says that love is the only motivating force in the universe, these are great aspects of faith. You know, when we talk about faith, we're not talking about just believing something for the sake of believing it. It's believing these, these statements about the nature of things 
that we can intuit but can't prove. You know, and so it's this notion that 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 love is the only motivating force. When he when he gives that information, he goes on to say that it's what ad what draws the electrons to the nucleus of the atom. It's what draws the planets to the sun. It's what draws the moon to the earth. That it's what draws the galaxy to the black hole in the middle. He's saying that that it's these are all manifestations of love. It, this attracting power of the divine. And so this is one of those tenets of faith that you can stand on. You sit and you look at your life. You look at the horrible things that happened to you today. And you do not let go of the notion that all of it was for your good. That somehow you're going to grow because of it. Because what is he says here, what he says here, he says that we cannot learn to, to we cannot realize that without tri trials and tribulations, we cannot resign once ourselves to God and to depend on him absolutely. So it's these, it's these things that the beloved does to bring us closer to him. Because those times when you're hurting, when you're suffering, those are the times you're looking. You're trying to see God. You're trying to believe God. You're trying to, to take some comfort there. So he puts you in those difficult situations because those are the ways to wake you up the easiest, you know, to get you to pay attention. When you're sitting there bouncing down, you know, Hollywood Boulevard with your friends, all decked out in your <laughs> some of the crazy things I see down there on the weekends, <laughs> these people going out like I was like, oh my god, <laughs> okay. So you know, those aren't the times you're thinking of God, right? Uh, people looking at you are thinking of God, like my God, what's <laughs> that person doing? Rom, 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 rom. You know, but you're just blissfully going on. So just understand the nature of things. You know that the suffering in your life is as beautiful as the sunny days bounding in the park, thinking of hamburgers. You know that that all of this has the same essence behind it. And that the only, the only goal in the midst of it, seemingly, is the knowledge of that. The knowledge of love as the nature of all things. To know that you are one with all things, and that's the root of that love. That, that, is, that is everywhere, this presence of God. So this is what it is to spend some time without the master in the room. Still a lot of laughter, still a lot of joy still a lot of understanding, still a lot of celebration. And this is what you have to work with. Scriptures upon scriptures from all the world's traditions now. You don't have to pick just one. You can be thrilled with the Quran, enlightened by the Bible, digging deeply into Hafiz, studying the Tao, all of these things and see the master dancing in all of them you know, teaching and lifting and correcting and inspiring and moving us all forward as, as one very big family, <laughs> if not always happy, <laughs> at least challenged. Anybody have any questions or concerns or insights? Like, you're really naughty and you don't listen to me. You can do this for me. Da, 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 da. And in a very adorable way. And I, I was reminded of that. So she had a very playful relationship yeah. with Krishna. Some days she'd be like, oh, you look sad. What happened? Um, like, she it was very alive. Um, and I wanted to ask you about love equanimous or equanimity, which you've mentioned a couple of times. Hmm. What do you want to ask about it? <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean? Yes. Well, it means love without an ego. You know, love that's not directed by an ego. We've, we've got this. We've got this fire hose of love just spewing out in all directions, and the ego is is one of those gardening attachments. You know, so that you can control where it goes, and you can turn it off and turn it on at will. And so we use it. We use it to milk the world to please the ego. And to be equanimous in your love, it's the ability to forgive somebody on the spot by truly forgetting that it even happened. 
You know, it's, it's living in the now so completely that you're not keeping records of things. You're not creating karma. That's how, that's how a realized soul lives in the world without creating karma, is that they are fully present always. There's no thought of a past. There's no thought of a future. There's just isness. And that releases them from the idea of cause and effect. That releases them because they're not living in a boundaried sense of the world, right? Because that's what ego causes us to do. It causes us to put boundaries all the time, everywhere. And that's how we come up with ideas of cause and effect. You know, if you put boundaries down, then you can say that's a cause and this is the effect. But if that boundary was twice as wide, you'd say, oh my gosh, no, wait, that's a cause for this, but the effect of that, simultaneously that it's the cause of that, which is the effect of this. And you'd realize that cause and effect makes no sense whatsoever, that everything is both a cause and effect in itself at the same time, always. You know, and that cause and effect is only a creation, a function of mind, a concept of mind. Well, uh, there's, yeah, there, there's a couple things. One, Sri Nishragadatta says that the moment contains everything in it that you need to navigate it perfectly. So if something needs to be done, that need to do will manifest in the moment with it. The other idea, too, is that that story that I always bring up, the, the scorpion falling into the water that there is a certain amount of acceptance and surrender possible, uh, you know, uh, in those situations. And of course, this all takes buddhi. It's like there's not one answer that's going to cover every circumstance. Uh, but there are times when acceptance is a way through. You know, it's like, I don't know why this is like this, but here it is, you know. Uh, and if there's a way out of it, you know, uh, what, what's a... Uh, Eckhart Tolle gives three ways of dealing with things that are not acceptable in your life or, or three situations where you have resistance. You're, you're pushing against what is. He says the first one is give, give, give your voice. Speak up. Make your needs known. Speak out against the situation and try and articulate change that way. He says the second way is, is uh, to surrender to it, to accept it and embrace it fully if that's possible. And he says, if those two aren't possible, the third one is get yourself out of the situation completely, however that is. Uh, he, says, he says, any other options are madness. So you've basically got those three. Speak your voice, embrace it completely, or get out of the situation. Those are your three choices. Don't settle. That was his point in that chapter. Settling is madness. Don't just settle. So either accept or surrender, but don't settle. And that's right. kind of the subtle difference. Yeah, the subtle difference means that, that you're just either too afraid to act, you're being, you're, being, you're being cowardly about it, you don't want to do what's, what's being presented, you don't want to put out the energy, you don't want to take the risk, whatever, you know. Passive aggressive. Yeah, passive aggressive. So that's, those, those are things when you're settling. Yeah. Settling and surrender are very different. Surrender means that you actually see it as beautiful and pos positive and perfect, you know, because you've just let go of any notion of something different. So it's a very high state to be able to surrender like that. But that's, that's our ideal. Inspired talk, Swamiji says, the brute stays where he is, doesn't do anything. The man always tries to go for good, but God does neither. Let us be God. There it is. So I, was like, I, I was thinking Tamas, Raja, Safwa, maybe. But they say that God's inactiveness, inaction, is like different from the brute's inaction. The two ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what we're really trying to do is, is to realize we're dreaming while we're dreaming. 
so that, you know, think of what a dream would be like. Well, you know what it's like when you believe it to be real, right? These five guys chasing you, they're going to catch you, and God only knows what's going to happen. You better run. We know what that experience is, but what is it if you were running and being chased by these guys and you come to realize, I'm dreaming? Think of how the behavior would be different. And even if it wasn't different, how much more playful it would suddenly be. It wouldn't be urgent to stay away from them because you'd know they can't kill me. You know, and we've been told in this life that we can't be killed. We've been told that the soul is, you know, immortal and can't be added to or taken from, can't be burned, can't be wedded, can't be all those things, you know. But, uh, you know, it doesn't help much if someone comes out of the dark and holds a gun to your head. <laughs> You're like, I can't, I can't be burned. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't. You didn't say shot. I can't. Exactly what I was getting. It's like, what, what about shot? You didn't say shot. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah, but uh, you know, so uh, like that. But the goal is to be aware. Just be aware, as much as you can, always. That in that awareness, things fix themselves. You look at a situation. If you can become aware that it's wrong that awareness will untie the knot ultimately. By knowing your faults, you will, you will be changed. It's not that you change yourself. You will be changed sitting in the presence of God every day for your hour or two hours of practice. You will be changed, you know, so. Marge, on that, like being in the dream and playing the game in the dream while knowing it's a, it's, it's a game. Mm -hmm. So something Takur says, I am very curious about your take. It's very early on, and is talking to Takur like before the Durga Puja, early in the book. And you know, Master gives the metaphor of the boy running around breathlessly, and then the mother comes, and then Takur uh, M thinks, why should we run around though? Why does God make us run about? And M says, oh, then it's all great. So it's all, it's all great fun. So he takes his attitude, mm -hmm. and then later on in, in that same page, he says, that's why one must propitiate Avidya, one must uh, propitiate the mother, uh, she who cast the spells. And then he says, but the worship of Shakti is extremely difficult. You know, and then there's like a note of seriousness there. What, how do you read that as? Well, just exactly that. It's like, it's one thing to say you know you're dreaming. <laughs> it's another thing to know you're dreaming. You know, so, so even by saying that this world is a dream doesn't get you off the hook until you know this. What's that word? Grok. Until you grok this reality, you do not have the right to act from that perspective. You know, you cannot, you cannot say, uh, uh, you know, oh, well, that, that, uh, that one Vedantin that Ramakrishna talks to something about stealing or something, and the, the, the Dantin's idea was, oh, it's just, it's all illusion anyway. My stealing is just as much an illusion. And Ramakrishna literally says, I spit on that Vedanta. I spit on it. You know, it's like, we can't, we, we can't take the advantages of saying these things, like the Brahmin who killed the cow, remember? Yeah, okay, he killed the cow, and he said, I didn't kill the cow. God God killed the cow, you know. And so God comes down and starts walking through this Brahmin's garden in disguise and asking him about the flowers. Oh, who, who put those over there? That's a nice place for those. And he's like, oh, I, yeah, I put those there. And, put that. and of course, God reveals himself and says, what's this? If the cow's dead, I did it. But if the flower's in the right place, you did it. And so what is, you know, what's this story? So we have to be careful about that. You can't give yourself license, right? I think the way I like to think about this is that uh, there was a, there's a YouTube video of the, of the Pope giving a lecture, and behind the Pope is his throne sitting back there. And some little toddler gets away from his parents backstage somehow and, and wanders out onto stage <laughs> during this lecture. And sees this big old cool throne, and uh, you know climbs up into it like a toddler does, and sits there with his hands up on the on the railings like that. No security is running out. The Pope stops when he hears the laughing, the tittering going on, turns around and smiles also at the same time, and then continues on. And eventually, the mother or someone comes out and gets the kid off the throne and takes him away. Now that 
is what it is to be authentic, okay? That's, if you're in that state of the child where you're just being what you're being in that freedom of being, you can get away with walking out on the stage and sitting in the Pope's chair. Now, if I were to walk out on the stage <laughs> and sit in the Pope's chair, probably wouldn't go so well for me, right? I mean, probably I'd either be tackled or, you know, who knows, hope for the Pope mobile. I, you know, something would happen very unpleasant for me. So that's, that's what he's saying there. He's saying you have to o obey You have, to, you have to obey the rules given to you by your karma, by what you really think. Yeah. You can't grab what you mentally know and, and take an advantage from it before it's yours. When it's yours... So, so it's like one is that you know intellectually the knowledge and then try to justify or manipulate what is truly being realized. Yeah, like, like Ramakrishna, when he says to Vivekananda, I've seen God like you. Uh -huh. And the person that Vivekananda is so well read and intelligent, he could say anything because he comes from some view. Versus if I say to somebody, I'll probably get a slap. Right. <laughs> because I'm just reading something and telling somebody. Right. And the, the way you can feel the difference yeah. is that somebody acting spontaneously doesn't have a conscious reason for what they're doing. Somebody who's acting or borrowing from license yeah. knows why they're doing it. Oh, I can do this because I'm not the doer. I can do this because I'm free. I can do this because you'll have the calculating because the calculating's been done. If the calculating's been done, it's not an authentic move. It has to be a spontaneity. It has to come from, from inside and manifest. It doesn't come from the mind and get acted on. It comes from inside and is, and is manifested. So that would be a difference. If you, if you had to think about whether or not you were allowed to go up and sit on Takor's lap after the talk tonight, probably a better idea not to do it. If in some great joy and love for God you spontaneously find yourself walking up to sit on Takor's lap on the shrine tonight, you might get away with it <laughs> if none of the nuns are here. <laughs> but, uh, so, but it's that idea, you know. So be the, 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 the realized soul is always spontaneous because there's no past and no future for them. So there's no calculation. There's no personality. There's no karma. They're just manifesting that divinity, Satchitananda, in real time. So their love is equanimous. Their, number, their love is spilling in every direction. Their wisdom is manifesting in everything that they say and do. Uh, so you're yeah. saying the bhava, the authentic bhava of being like a child of Makali, that's extremely difficult in Nojo. He's not referring to the like puja. Right. Because right, right, he says before the rites of Shakti worship, but he means this move. Yeah. Because in other places they'll say, oh, just do a little bit. You just need to do a little bit of practice. And typically he's understating, right? This is the one time I'm seeing using him using hyperbole for practice. Because usually practice, he always understates it. And this time he's exaggerating. And this is, yeah, this well, because it's a very important point, for sure, that we don't take license from these, from grace. You know, you don't say, oh, God loves me. I can do whatever I want. Right. Not because it's not true, but because you're going to end up suffering because it wasn't an authentic act. It was an egoistic act, and so you're going to be led into suffering from it. So we don't, we don't act. In fact, it is true, everything is by grace. God does love you that much, but that doesn't mean the stove's not gonna burn your hand when you touch it, right. you know? So that kind of thing. But uh, yes, so live authentically. Dance with God, take a chance though. I do encourage you to take a chance. Do something that might seem a little bit off, but do it for love and <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> see, if, see if mother slaps your hand or not. <laughs> no, he said he won't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, well she, it's, she it's, might. No, he said it, but mother didn't say well, it. Well, mother, well, mother can still let you have it. No, but it's only for those people who are distracted. That's the only time they slap people, right? Like when they're doing something like in the name of God, but then they don't actually mean it. No, no, I, I think any time that you, that you, any time that you act contrary to your nature, mm. 
you're gonna you're gonna get maybe not a slap. It can be worse than a slap, yeah. but I mean you'll get something. That's the nature of this world. This world is meant to spit you out into God's lap. You know, the, you can't you can't get away with anything in this world because Mother wants you to come back to unity. She wants you to come back to your full your highest ideal. And so anytime you act contrary to your nature, contrary to love, contrary to wisdom, contrary to presence, then you get a poke. You know, she'll take her cue stick and <laughs> get you going in the right direction. <laughs> All right, Jai Thakur, Jai Ma, Jai Swamiji.